Um, I also want to have a little round of applause here for Dr. Daniel Sturman because uh, Dr. Sturman was actually the catalyst for us thinking about getting into funding clinical trials. It was stemmed uh, from a uh, conversation we had at a small group meeting, and uh, Dr. Sturman is really one of the thought leaders in this disease and really has helped me to sort of clarify my mind some of the directions that we need to lead in. So, Dan, thank you very much for uh, your help. So, you're both pulmonologists, am I correct? Yes. Okay. So. We have two pulmonologists who have really, um, you almost model more of what we see in the UK where we have the pulmonary specialists leading a lot of the malignancies. And here you, you really play a very key role in mesothelioma and very, a very unique role. Um, we don't usually have a pulmonologist so involved with the medical aspects of a, of a, of a malignancy. So I'm, I'm wondering, um, in terms of clinical trials, um, you, you know, you, you're both involved in clinical trials. Tobias, what is your interest in clinical trials? Where, where is your focus today? So uh, my f background is obviously, like Mary said, I'm a pulmonary physician. Uh, I'm also interested in immunology, and so my uh, interest is really uh, cancer immunotherapy and viral, viral therapy of malignancies using oncolytic viruses. And the clinical trial that I'm currently involved with actually uses the Mises virus, which was mentioned in one of the previous presentations as an oncolytic virus and we are administering, administering this virus directly into the pleural space using a Purex catheter with the hope that the virus will potentially directly kill uh, tumor cells by recognizing them more uh, better than, than the surrounding normal cells and that the virus might also function as a vaccine triggering an anti-tumor immune response as an additional effect. Uh, here and our study is currently a phase one study, which is fairly early in its development, and uh, uh, that's uh, what my clinical trial involvement is at this time. Uh, certainly, as Mary pointed out, as pulmonologists, we are typically more involved at the beginning of the disease, specifically diagnosing the disease, staging the disease. But uh, from my perspective, I think it's also important that we follow through and are involved in the therapeutics of the disease. So I come from a very similar background as Tobias. Uh, my background is a, as a pulmonologist. Uh, I also uh, am one of the pioneers in a new, relatively new field called interventional pulmonology, which is new here in the United States and involves, it's kind of a hybrid between some aspects of thoracic surgery and pulmonary medicine in which we use uh, scopes in the air passages and in the chest cavity to diagnose and treat uh, chest cancers and other diseases. And my interest is in combining some of the things that Tobias said, which is the ability to deliver uh, novel treatments, often which involve stimulating the body's immune system to fight cancer, and then using some of these other instrument-based techniques, the scopes into the lungs and into the chest cavity, to the pleural space, to both deliver and monitor the benefits of therapy. So. Um, I'm a plumber, but I'm a plumber that is an interest in what's going on inside the plumbing. And uh, my, my goal is that we work together as a team. I think that the, the answers to mesothelioma are not gonna come from one discipline. It's not gonna be just from surgery or just from radiation therapy, just from medical oncology. So I think that pulmonologists are used to working as part of a team. We often have to take a team approach to diagnosing patients and managing them, and so that we fit in very well to the team that's going to manage patients with mesothelioma both in the fact that we can help with the diagnosis and the staging of the disease, as well as helping in guiding the best therapies. And it's always good, I think, to have a pulmonologist on board if you're discussing, for example, surgery or radiation therapy, because underlying lung function is gonna have a great impact upon whether or not a patient's going to be a candidate for an intervention. Uh, a patient may be a, a, a perfect candidate for surgery, but may not be someone who could survive the surgery from a lung function perspective. So I think our general pulmonary skills do come in handy, even though we're very interested in the scientific side. So, um, Tobias, I wonder if you could just, um, just the basics. Uh, after an extra plumal, uh, pleural luminectomy, how does a patient breathe? Could you sort of explain, you know, how the other lung will take over and, and sort of some of the changes of, you know, what are patients to expect following that type of a surgery? Uh, yeah, the extra pleural pneumonectomy is obviously a very uh, invasive surgery, as 
uh, you've heard in some of the previous presentations, during an extra pleural pneumonectomy, uh, the lung as well as the pleural surfaces are pretty much excised and in an end block procedure. So they all come out as one piece, so to speak. And uh, what that pretty much does is not only does it mean a lot of trauma to the patient, so it's a big surgery that causes quite a bit of tissue inju injury and, and it results in, in uh, has to require a lot of healing afterwards. You also pretty much lose 50% of your lung function in, in, in this context. And it's also important to know that as we all go through life, we acquire lung diseases that affect our lungs. And so if I say 50% of your lung function, you're basically left with the other half of your, your lung, and that may be affected by a different disease. For instance, uh, some patients smoked during their use, and they may, may have COPD or emphysema, which may affect the other lung. So it may not be exactly 50% of the ideal lung function. So it really drops your lung function quite a bit and causes, in, in that context, your functional status to, to potentially deteriorate. And in some situations, patients to, to be left with a functional status that would be very difficult to maintain their quality of life and potentially require oxygen. And obviously that's one of the things that we try to avoid by selecting patients appropriately when, they, when we decide what surgical procedure they, they are subjected to, that we actually really try to preserve quality of life as, as best as possible and preserve lung function as much as possible with these surgical procedures and try to do this in a proactive fashion where we actually try to select the right candidates for the right surgical procedure up front because uh, in contrast to extra pleuronectomy, pleurectomy and decortication, the competing surgical strategy is designed to preserve the lung and therefore patients actually typically end up with more lung function at the end of the procedure. But I think it's important to recognize that it's a, it's, it is a dramatic change. Uh, that being said, typically, if you have healthy lungs, one lung actually can provide pretty good function for a patient. Uh, as is actually uh, ex an example for that is that when we perform lung transplantations in patients with end-stage lung disease, we actually uh, frequently only transplant one lung, and patients can gain uh, decent lung function after a single lung transplant. Uh, Dr. Sturman, uh, following an extra pleural pneumonectomy, if you develop a pleural effusion, um, how safe <coughs> is it to uh, insert a pleurex catheter for draining those infusions at home? Are you talking about on the side where uh, the pneumonectomy was done? No, or the I'm talking about the contralateral side? side when the disease I think returns. it's very safe. I mean, we, you have to use ultrasound to guide those procedures. Mm -hmm. And I think as long as you're using ultrasound guidance mm -hmm. uh, and the person who's doing the procedure knows what they're doing, it should not be a problem. Okay. I mean, the biggest concern from my perspective is that when you have a pleural effusion on the side of your remaining lung, that it's a harbinger that the disease has now recurred in the site where you only have one lung remaining, and it's a bad prognostic sign, unfortunately. So I think we can do procedures, but from a, a prognostic perspective, I think we have to be honest with ourselves about what it means to have that pleural effusion on that side. If, if it turns out to be positive, for example, for tumor cells. And now, uh, how do you manage, um, uh, what, what is the rate of infections in, uh, when, once you've inserted a pleurex catheter? I believe it's pretty low, am I correct? It's 5% uh, or less right. mm -hmm. in general, and most of them can be managed by a course of oral antibiotics, leaving the catheter in place. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, Radiation-induced pneumonitis, uh, we hear about that a lot. Could you explain a little bit about what it is and then how is it managed? Sure. Yeah, I, uh, so radiation pneumonitis is, is pretty much an inflammatory response that's caused by the ionizing radiation uh, exposure uh, of the lung. Uh, we uh, really manage this uh, with anti-inflammatory therapy. So for the most part, that involves a, a course of prednisone that, that is administered to uh, these patients. The dose and length of the therapy varies a little bit between centers. So a lot of this is what centers have established in their experience of being being helpful, but uh, and in addition to that, uh, you try to provide supportive care uh, to the patient. Obviously, we are trying to limit uh, radiation pneumonitis. Also, again, 
when we plan therapies for these patients. And that highlights another, or again, the point that Dan already made, that this is really a team approach. And, and that's how we look at these patients, that this is a multidisciplinary team that's looking after the patient where really all these specialties, radiation oncology, surgery, uh, medical oncology, and pulmonary medicine actually come together and take care of an individual from the beginning where we plan the, the, the therapy and in the context of planning therapy, trying to minimize uh, the amount of radiation exposure to the lung that's not affected by the disease or the, the lung itself and then really focusing the radiation to the surface of the lung where the tumor is using a strategy called IMRT. Uh, it, it's really something that you're doing up front to try to prevent these complications like radiation pneumonitis. But when we uh, encounter it, it's an inflammatory response caused by the ionizing radiation that we then treat with uh, anti-inflammatory agents. I just want to comment that it's important to distinguish between radiation pneumonitis and radiation fibrosis. Radiation fibrosis is the scarring, which is often the result of radiation-induced pneumonitis that may have been treated or may not have been treated. The important differentiation is that the medications that Tobias was mentioning, the anti-inflammatories, often have their own toxicities. So prednisone and other steroids can be toxic when taken for long periods of time. Many of you who are patients in the audience have been on these drugs and there are side effects. And if you're giving that for someone with radiation fibrosis, with fixed scarring in the lung, there is really no benefit and just harm. So it's very important to distinguish between whether there's active inflammation in the lung that would benefit from steroids and fixed scarring that's not gonna benefit. And there are also some other side effects of radiation that we do see. Um, we actually see uh, pleural effusions on occasion, and it's really important from a prognostic perspective. We were just talking about pleural effusions on the side of the remaining lung. If you've had radiation, it's not uncommon. You get a small pleural effusion, and you drain it, and there are no tumor cells in it. And that is just from radiation injury to the pleura itself and not indicative of a progression of the disease. So very important to distinguish. And then we're often seeing, uh, I can't say often, but we're occasionally seeing some patients with heart problems that from, from radiation therapy and the complications that may arise uh, from, from that, especially the pericardium, which can become stiff uh, and limits heart function. And, and sometimes pleural effusions occur because the pericardium becomes stiff and scarred from the radiation therapy. So I think it's important to remember that radiation therapy is quite beneficial for a lot of our patients and relatively few of them have serious complications. But I think as pulmonologists, we have to be aware and help our colleagues in radiation oncology in terms of managing these patients. So I often hear from patients or I you know, suggest quite often that they go for pulmonary rehab. Can you talk a little bit about what pulmonary rehab means and how often you refer patients or the type of patients you think will benefit from pulmonary rehab? Yeah, and I think that's a very common question. Uh, pulmonary rehab uh, as a program is actually very similar to uh, cardiac rehab, which is a structured exercise program where people actually get monitored and actually get taught uh, pretty much aerobic exercise uh, regimens as well as some breathing techniques. So these programs run for six to eight weeks and are pretty much designed to introduce patients to a regular exercise schedule and make them actually comfortable exercising with the goal to uh, exercise on their own. And I really liked the comment that one of the previous panelists made, actually Dr. Sugarbaker, regarding like, that this is kind of a uh, athletic event going through these types of therapies. And I'm actually, personally not necessarily focused on sending people to pulmonary rehab or cardiac rehab. I think the, the, the patients need to do what they are comfortable with. Everybody needs to understand that maintaining your health and maintaining physical activity through these very difficult treatments is actually very important for a good outcome. It actually raises your spirits. It kind of keeps you sane as you're going through all these treatments. And it also, I think, in my mind, has a positive effect on the immune system, on everything else in your body and, and trying to figure out the best way to do that, I think it's very important. And if in that context, pulmonary rehab is, 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 is helpful, I certainly am happy to refer people to, to pulmonary rehab in this context. I would say we've underutilized pulmonary rehabilitation and maybe we're babying our patients a little bit, but I, I fully agree with what Tobias said. Uh, it's a, extremely helpful, it's non-toxic, it's generally reimbursed by insurance companies, uh, and um, 
it, it can be extremely helpful. The other part of it is that it's often sort of group therapy. So when you go to pulmonary rehab, there are often other people going through the same process, maybe not all who are recovering from surgery or treatment for mesothelioma, but all who have some impairment in lung function. And there's some benefit to supporting each other during that process. So I, but my patients who have gone through pulmonary rehab enjoy it. Uh, part of it is it gets them out of the house mm -hmm. uh, and doing something and being active and being part of a community. Yeah, maybe giving a little bit of a control back to a patient. It's actually, uh, and we are trying to expand this into mesothelioma. We actually have a very active uh, program at our institution that's actually focusing on the rehab aspect, but then also of self-empowerment of patients, where you actually kind of take control of your disease and you actually actively are involved in the care, but also actively are involved in doing things in your activity during your daily life and activity of daily living. And that's actually been very helpful for other patient groups already. So we hope that this will also translate into uh, help in, in the mesothelioma community, but uh, in, in, for instance, in chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, it's actually been uh, very helpful beyond just the physical exercise part of, of this. Uh, and I'm also wondering, um, you know, a cough, chronic cough seems to be such a complaint in this community. Tricks of the trade, first of all, what is chronic cough? What is the cough? What are the underlying uh, causes of the cough? And then maybe what are some of the remedies that are used? And I know I'm asking, it's a wide open, I know there's a lot of different reasons, but if you can go into some of the basics of what the most common, common causes of cough in a mesothelioma patient. Uh, you have to understand that uh, I think it's easier to treat mesothelioma than it is to treat chronic cough. Mm -hmm. uh, chronic cough is, the, I think, the most difficult diagnosis that a pulmonologist has, and we often dread when a patient comes in, especially when they've been through multiple other physicians first, and then they come to you, and they've had exhausted workup. So in the context of mesothelioma, the chronic cough can be from a multitude of things, and it really depends whether they're newly pre presenting and there's a large pleural effusion or whether they've had radiation therapy and there's radiation fibrosis or they've had surgery and uh, they're just recovering. So it really depends upon the context. Mm -hmm. But it can be a very difficult thing to treat, and there is no one drug mm -hmm. to use. Um, I think that one of the things that we'd like to avoid is over-medicating people with chronic cough. Narcotic medications are okay for treating chronic cough, but they over-sedate patients. Mm -hmm. And if you have marginal lung function because of underlying disease, including mesothelioma, then suppressing respiration is not a great idea. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't get at the root cause. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, cough is extremely complex in general for patients who don't have mesothelioma, for patients who come to pulmonologists, the most common cause of chronic cough are post-nasal drip, sinus disease, so nose and sinus disease, and reflux disease. So I think the first thing that we do, at least that I do when patients come to the office, is aggressively treat your post-nasal drip and your esophageal reflux. And it may be that post-surgery, for example, mesothelioma, your reflux may be worse. So you may need that more aggressively treated. So that's something we can relatively easily do, although medication doesn't always fix the problem because it may be an anatomic issue. Your stomach may have moved up in the chest with your diaphragm after surgery, and that change of position may increase the amount of reflux that you have. Sinus disease and nasal disease are very, very common. Um, and so treating that aggressively, getting ENT doctors involved if you have chronic sinus problems is also important. So I think I, I work on those. And then asthma is the other thing that we see. Asthma is a very common disease. Mesothelioma is rare, but I, there probably are many patients with mesothelioma who have underlying asthma who aren't being adequately treated. So I think the first three things that you treat are underlying asthma, post-nasal drip, sinus disease, reflux disease. After that, uh, you're getting into a very big gray zone of where other things can come into place. Uh, in terms of tricks, uh, beyond that, um, there is some data using a drug called gabapentin or Neurontin that was recently published in the journal Lancet a couple of years ago for the refractory chronic cough. Again, this is a drug which is used for just about anything, chronic pain, seizures. It's been studied in chronic cough. I don't have a lot of experience with it, but it's something that I'm trying for our patient, my patients who are just not responding to anything else. Mm -hmm. And now I'm gonna pass it to Tobias and see if he can enlighten me on what he does. No, and I have to agree with Dan that, that in general, it's, we also focus first on these three most common causes of chronic cough, and we make sure that since mesothelioma is a rare disease, common things being common, you still have to make sure that it's not one of these other three big players in the, in the context of chronic cough. 
If, if that's not the case, the other important thing is to really make sure that the patients actually understand what cough means and that cough actually serves a physiologic function, meaning clearing your airway, mm -hmm. and that having the occasional cough is actually not necessarily a bad thing. So I really try to understand how debilitating cough is. If, of course, cough becomes debilitating to the degree that p p patients cannot go out and attend social functions and cannot sleep at night, these are the kinds of patients, if you don't find the cause of their cough, where you want to look for anything possible to try to alleviate it on an individualized basis, such as dealing with the pleural fusion very aggressively or uh, trying to eliminate other potential contributors. And if, if that's not the case, then we're pretty much down to symptomatic therapy. And Dan already pointed towards the gabapentin, another <coughs> thing that we've used uh, in oca on occasions actually with quite some regularity is actually just uh, uh, topical anesthesia, so nebulized lidocaine to basically provide uh, a numbing effect in, in the posterior throat, in the, in the back of the throat, to try to break the cycle of, of coughing and trying to make people more comfortable. But similar to what Dan was saying, the, the, the problems with opiates, obviously opiates like morphine and other Opiates, they suppress <coughs> cough at a central level, at the brain level, and in this context, they can make people drowsy and can make people difficult to function during the day. Lidocaine doesn't do that, but of course, lidocaine, if you numb up the back of your throat, it's pretty much like going to the dentist, and it becomes very hard to eat and, and, and drink after that and without getting uh, things down the wrong pipe and aspirating. So all of these things have their pros and cons, and if you don't find any of these big three causes, you're pretty much stuck trying to individualize therapy as much as possible after you determine that, that this patient really needs some help with the cough. Mm -hmm. oh, so I'm hearing vaporize, I'm thinking about medical marijuana now. So what about you know people who are giving prescriptions to medical marijuana who have one lung or compromised lungs? How does inhaling these type of substances, does it affect the lungs, does it hurt breathing? To be honest, I, I'm I don't have a lot of experience with that, so I, I guess uh, in the state where I'm practicing, there, there's, uh, I don't think medical, I think there's a way to get medical marijuana. Uh, it's, it's not uh, been really in, in my practice that much. I don't think that it would have a very detrimental effect on the lungs, theoretically, but... It's important to understand that you don't have to smoke medical marijuana, that medical marijuana comes in a liquid form that can be put in uh, foodstuffs, and, and, and that's how it's often taken. So it's hard to recommend someone who has undergoing lung disease to smoke something mm -hmm. that's going to make them feel better. They can take the same substance orally without injuring their lungs, because even though medical marijuana has clinical benefits, there are downsides to the lung to smoking marijuana, which are well proven. So I would recommend that if someone was prescribed, if they lived in a state where medical marijuana was legal, that they get the oral form, uh, however it is best administered, and not, uh, not smoke the drug. So Dr. Sturman, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you about um, what's happening with your gene therapy trials, because I know you've been championing gene therapy for so many years. Where are we with those trials now? Thank you for asking, Mary. We appreciate it. So we, we just completed, is that five minutes to go? Okay. Thank you, Melinda. That wasn't a five out of ten for our performance so no, that far? Was, no, that was five more questions. Okay. I thought we were on a five. I thought we were up at least 8.5. We're doing really well. Um, so we, we completed at the University of Pennsylvania, uh, the, I think, the largest gene therapy trial ever in mesothelioma. Um, just this past fall. When I say completed, we enrolled the last patient. We're still following many of the patients in the clinic. Uh, and this was 40 patients. Started in March of 2011. We finished in three years. We're summarizing our data and we'll be submitting it, hope, presenting it at the International Mesothelioma Interest Group meeting uh, this fall in Cape Town, South Africa, and hopefully also submitting for publication or at the same time frame. So um, what we did was take a drug uh, which is a virus, a, a virus that causes the common cold, uh, and this virus has been modified so that it can't cause illness in human beings, but it carries the gene for human interferon alpha. And this gene gets inside cancer cells and causes cancer cells to produce the interferon alpha within the tumor cells themselves and stimulates the body's immune system to recognize and start to fight the cancer. And we give this together with standard of care chemotherapy, both in the front line, 
with pemetrexid, and in the second line with gemcitabine. And so the study is stratified between frontline and second line patients. And particularly in the second line, we appear to be seeing uh, a significant signal in terms of benefit, in terms of long-term survival. So we hope to analyze all of our data in the next few weeks, uh, submit our abstract to IMIG and submit our paper, but also we are in the planning stages right now for the next phases of the clinical trials, including what we hope would be a multi-center randomized clinical trial in the second line between gemcitabine-based chemotherapy versus gemcitabine-based chemotherapy with the gene therapy combination. So we're very excited. Uh, we're not enrolling patients currently because we're trying to decide which direction to go in. Uh, and uh, we hope to be restarted relatively soon. That's great. So when you do disclose the results, I know that you know, we'd be very interested to get it out to the community. Thank you. Um, I have one question that came from the audience. Uh, it's sort of, sort of taking us a little off track, but um, do you see any late effects of radiation? So in other words, not in the immediate time period after radiation, but maybe years later, do you see any, uh, any long-lasting or any new side effects that develop over time? And uh, yeah, with the acute radiation pneumonitis is what we discussed, but there is radiation fibrosis that Dan pointed out, and this radiation fibrosis in some patients actually can be progressive and can basically cause progressive scarring of the lung, which then presents as more of an interstitial lung disease that, that can limit the breathing capacity of, of these patients. And the same is true for some of the other organs that Specifically, for instance, the pericardium, the sac in, in which the heart is basically enclosed in, that uh, late effects of radiation could be scarring of the sac, which can then limit the ability of the heart to expand and, and basically perform its pump function. So, so these later scarring effects can actually occur and can be quite debilitating, but unfortunately they're actually uh, relatively rare and they, they don't occur with, with a very high frequency. I would just add one other uh, side effect, late side effect of radiation that we see which is not well described in the medical literature which is radiation bronchitis is what I call it for want of a better term in the medical literature. When you give radiation and the central airways are in the field on occasion they can become chronically inflamed and scarred, they don't clear mucus normally Patients can be susceptible to recurrent infection. They may cough up a small amount of blood periodically. They may have a shorter breath. They may have wheezing. Um, and this is a, a phenomenon that's very difficult to treat. And it's in the spectrum of chronic cough that you would see in those patients who've had radiation therapy. And it can be very debilitating. And one of the things that I use actually is what Tobias recommended, which is nebulized lidocaine. I find it very beneficial for the patients with radiation bronchitis. Thank you. So I guess we're getting ready to conclude. Is there anything that you'd like to add that we didn't bring up in the discussion that you think might be important to share with the patients? I think the, just to summarize things, in my mind, it's the most important thing is really to take this team approach actually between all of us, all the specialties that I mentioned, but then also the patients. So I think it, it's actually very important for us to get you guys all involved and, and, and be active and, and that the best outcome and the most credit, a lot of credit actually goes to the patient being actively involved in, in this process and, and helping to get better. I just want to say thank you for having me here. It's always an incredible honor to be part of this very unique meeting, uh, being together with uh, patients, family members, loved ones, significant others, um, advocates, industry, scientists. It really is uh, an incredible experience for me and I renew this experience every time I come back here and it gives me great faith that we're together going to get an answer for this disease. So thank you for having me. Thank you.